All right, so I'm gonna do the piece to camera and hopefully I can do it in one take. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome back Pathless Peddlers to another episode of PLP Talks where we have interesting conversations with interesting bikey people. And if you're new to this series, we've had some amazing guests. Last week we spoke with Benedict, AKA Ultra Romance. We spoke with uh, good old Nam, who was a former uh, Blackburn Ranger. We've had Sarah Swallow on the show, our friend Martina Bremer from Swift Industries, uh, super bikepacking endurance athletes, Kurt Refsnyder and Jay Peterberry. So a uh, super awesome uh, group of folks. And uh, if you guys like this content, uh, consider being a financial subscriber for three bucks a month. You can keep me in hard drives because <laughs> these interviews take up uh, a lot of room. And uh, so moving on to today's guest is a person that we've uh, had a chance to meet a couple times in person and follow her online. A uh, big advocate of uh, bikes and art and also one of the co-founders, co-hosts of a upcoming WTF Explorer Summit. Uh, so let's welcome to the show Whitney Ford Terry. Hey, Whitney. <laughs> Morning. Yeah. Um, so one, I think one of the things that's really fascinating about the stuff you do is like there's this big kind of uh, correlation between uh, bikes and art. And recently you did a bike packing trip and combined it with uh, a route that seeks out like uh, seeks out land art sites. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like my jam. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's a lot of uh, so land art was a movement in like the late 70s and it became really kind of a uh, became really popular because it's just like work with the land that's like out in the middle of nowhere and so i became really fascinated with the idea of like using a bike to get there mm -hmm. um so, so basically like riding out to a place like that kind of puts you in like a really interesting mindset when you ride a bike for a really long time as i'm sure you've experienced you just kind of like zone out and you start kind of connecting ideas and places and things that you normally wouldn't otherwise kind of think about mm -hmm. and so um the most recent trip i took was actually around the great salt lake and so a friend of mine who had actually not done a bike tour before <laughs> it's like we found each other on instagram and i was like i want to do this thing uh meet me at the golden spike which is like natural uh or national monument uh it's in the middle of nowhere <laughs> it really is like an hour or two drive north of salt lake city um, I was like, meet me at the Golden Spike with three days worth of food and water, just about like 10, 12 liters. Um, and we, we can go from there. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we started there and we actually followed like this old uh, decommissioned railway line. that was like an all dirt path that kind of went around the northern part of the lake. And along those sections is a piece by Robert Smithson called the Spiral Jetty, which is this like really wild, like curved um jetty space in the middle of like this red pink lake um it's like a really just like absolutely otherworldly experience um and so from there we kept following the railway line out to a couple of ghost towns and then ended up um at nancy holt sun tunnels which is this like really amazing concrete tubes uh that have these celestial patterns that actually like mimic constellations in the sky um it's a really incredible piece and uh they're actually married <laughs> that's why i think they're kind of close by because they're just in the area um and they both just really identified with that landscape um and ended up in wendover which is this old uh, Air Force Base uh, that's been recently turned over into an artist residency space by the Center for Land Use Interpretation. Mm -hmm. So it's just this like punch in a key code, and there's this like this exhibit on an Air Force Base <laughs> in Wendover, Utah. It's just like it's nuts. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it's just really fun to actually like physically connect those spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think like when I when you started talking about that um, idea for a trip, I was really intrigued. Uh, I actually took some art history classes in college. And I think most people experience land art just through pictures, you yeah. know, like that's, that's yeah. usually like the only way that most people get to see spir things like Spiral Jetty. Uh, so it's really cool that you actually went out there. Um, so how, how do you think the experience is, is different? Like, do you get like just that massive sense of scale or? Yeah. I mean, like the idea that it is like, like larger than human scale. And also I think just like 
there was this quote from uh, Nancy Holt that when she got off the plane in Salt Lake and actually like saw the desert in front of her, it was like the first time that her outside matched her inside. It was just like endless. Um, and there's just like, there's all of this like latent potential, but it's also very still. It's like anything can happen. It's just like lawless. <laughs> um, which is really interesting because um SF MoMA just recently started doing a series of podcasts about land art this year, um, specifically land art in California. And it's been really interesting listening to these podcasts about all these places that I've visited on my bike. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, I did one out to um, Joshua Tree. I had an artist residency at Andrea Zatel's wagon station encampment. There's a bunch of like hidden stuff out in the desert that you have to like find maps for. And like, it's just fun like going on the hunt too, like the <laughs> hunt. The landscape. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. The desert's a really amazing kind of open platform for something like that. Yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well uh, so was it fairly easy to access? I mean, what's what's usually around these big land art pieces? Is it public land, or do you have to traverse private land and negotiate that, or how does it work? Totally. It's actually really fascinating, especially for the Utah trip. So much of that space is public land, but it's public land, BLM land that has been leased to private landowners. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, it's been a really kind of interesting process going from like touring on like distinct, like actual like paved roads because not many questions there. Um, and over the last couple of years doing more bike packing, like trying to negotiate, especially like new routes that haven't really been designated or researched, mm -hmm. like finding what roads that the internet says you can use and what <laughs> roads. <laughs> um, and so a lot of those uh, roads in Utah, you can ride the road if you stay on the, on the road, but you can't go off the path. And there's like signs everywhere. They're like private property. Don't get off the road. And the road is just like, shitty double track right. <laughs> <laughs> ride. Yeah. and um yeah you go through a bunch of different designations and one of the things that i love about the center for land use interpretations exhibit in wendover is they had a huge wall size map of all of the different blm and uh public and private land designations mm -hmm. so you could actually like see it like writ large on the wall mm -hmm. and it was just like oh, okay we went to there and like that guy yelled at us and like yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> negotiating all of those things was a uh, is also part of the process. Right. Um, and a lot of these pieces are um, either on public land that has been designated as like a temporary monument site, um, or it's a piece that's on private land that they have decided to make public. So the Nancy Holt piece is on a private ranch right. that's accessible to the public. Right. Yeah. How often do you think these people or these uh, sites get visited? A lot. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually kind of amazing. I think um, also in the last couple of years, like, when camping got cool again, <laughs> people were like, oh, I'm going to, like, drive my sweet van out there. Um, so when we went out to Spiral Jetty, we camped there overnight, and it was, like, a 12-hour rainstorm. <laughs> but as soon as the skies cleared, you know, there was, like, maybe a dozen cars that came through okay. um, to visit the space. And... It's cool because it's accessible in that you don't have to pay for it, um, but you do have to like know where it is and like <laughs> put it out there and like not get lost. Um, yeah, it's like kind of a scavenger hunt, but like in a very large capacity. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, how did your uh, f uh, first time bike packer uh, companion fare? <laughs> so good yeah no. yeah Sophia was super rad and like we had never ridden together um and like first trip out met in the middle of nowhere you have to carry all of this stuff and uh she was just like dialed in she had it and the first 12 hours was in the rain so we rode there in the rain everything was wet we camped everything was wet <laughs> and uh, the next day it meant that everything was mud and so like first bike packing experience ever was just like rain 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 endless peanut butter mud like you can't even push your bike we actually had to go through um over these like over the scrub on the side of the road so that we wouldn't sink right <laughs> next morning um and like did some rerouting but like just a champ like the whole way through it was great cool yeah so it's always really fun to take people out like for the first time but also like you never really know <laughs> it's exciting when they're like oh yeah this isn't so bad you're like 
<laughs> nice. So what was uh how did you discover bike touring or bike travel in general? Wow, yeah. Um I I guess like I got my first bike that I didn't build at like a like community bike co op. <laughs> like my first non clunker bike was a was a cross bike. And I was living in Arcata, California. And the day that I got that bike, I think it was my 21st birthday. Um, I was so excited that I just like started riding up the coast of California um, and like just kept going. I <laughs> 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 uh, came back that night and decided to like pack my backpack with some like extra apples and like stuff my sleeping bag in there and just like rode to the to the Oregon border, half out the Oregon border and like came back. And I just got addicted to that, like, feeling of, like, I can carry everything I need. <laughs> Great. And so I started doing that a lot and just, like, sleeping in a ditch and, like, coming back and, like, going to class the next day. <laughs> and um, I ran into some people who were riding a Pacific Coast route, and I had, like, panniers. And I was like, what is this magic? <laughs> you can carry stuff, like, not on your back. This is amazing. Um, I had just been, like, a dirt bag using whatever I found. Um yeah, and then my first like bike tour, I like cut some straps off of old Jansport backpacks, like hooked them on the back of my bike. <laughs> and yours are close. <laughs> and yeah, it was just like a really amazing way for me to be able to just like feel very like self efficient, and like I I could go anywhere, I could do anything under my own power, and and that was really incredible. And I think better when I'm on a bike, mm -hmm. and so. That's actually part of like my process, you know, throughout undergrad and grad school is like, ah, oh, I need to figure out this thing. I'll go ride a bike about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you ride, like all these ideas come together and you're like, okay, great. And then you can come back. So, mm -hmm. so what's, uh, like, what do you think makes up a good bike route for touring? Oh, so my favorite thing is like kind of this constellation method where I'm like, okay, I want to visit that thing, that thing, that thing, say hi to that person, and, like, swim in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I find all these points, and then I find, like, the best or, like, funnest way to kind of connect them. Right. Um, right. I think, like, the best example of that was when I did that residency in Joshua Tree. I rode from Golden Saddle Cyclery, um, kind of, like, the weirdest way possible, <laughs> like, <laughs> up over the mountains and down into the desert because I wanted to visit like the bridge to nowhere and the Mount Wilson Observatory and like find the funnest way to kind of like get there. Mm -hmm. And so like your route ends up being like this weird pattern. Um, but that's what makes it fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. kind of connecting like interesting destinations along the way. Right. Yeah. I think a lot about like, uh, like a bike tour is a lot like a conversation, like it kind of like develops and progresses over time and you're getting themes and ideas as you go. And so there's like this whole air, like narrative landscape element to it that I really am like super excited about. So, yeah, that's something like, uh, you know, when we plan our tours now, it's, um, it's not bike touring just for the sake of touring, but it usually incorporates one of our other passions. Uh, right now it's like fly fishing. So we always yeah. try to connect fly fishing rivers. So I'm kind of fascinated by this idea of um, not like themed rides, but like, I, I guess in a way themed rides, rides that have like some other meta layer of, you know, dictating the experience, you know? So, yeah, that was actually like, um, when I was working in Seattle, I was, um, at this museum called the Henry Art Gallery. And I was doing a lot of public programming and a lot of my like projects that I was working on like ended up being outside the museum. And so I was like, well, what if we just like programmed like shows like outside and you had to ride your bike to get to them. And I got like really excited about that idea. And they're like, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> this place is more. Um, and so that was kind of part of the reason why I ended up like leaving that situation for a little while was to be develop something that was like kind of like a curated tour mm -hmm. of sorts. So it's fun to make those connections. Right. Yeah. Do you think yeah. that's, that'll be like a trend? Like, it seems like there's so many routes being punched up, uh, <laughs> you know, created right now yeah. that I feel like there's gotta be, you know, given so many routes, like how do you choose one? And I think it won't be the promise of like just good writing, but there's gotta be another 
kind yeah. of value proposition to it. Well, I think that's always kind of been a thing. Like I remember when I was working in adventure cycling, um, like talking to Casey Green about like, what makes a good trip? Like, you know, you've done this for a long time. <laughs> And, you know, he's just like, oh, like, like, pick a thing, like, make a theme. And, you know, it's like fire towers, go from fire tower to fire tower. Or, like, mm. it's hot springs. I'm like, that's how he developed the Idaho hot springs out. It's just like, pick a thing you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the WTF uh, Bike Explorer. Uh, is it a summit or what's the, how are you guys framing it exactly? Yeah, so the WTF Bike Explorers Summit, um, August 16th through 19th, save the date, um, is basically this opportunity for people to kind of come together and share stories, and we'll have some like kind of clinics and gear testing, uh, presentations. Um, folks are kind of like putting together a couple of different like workshop opportunities, kind of everything from like the history of like women in adventure travel, <laughs> like how to make, how to incorporate self-care, right. <laughs> you know, a long distance, multi-day, multi-week, multi-month bike tour. Um, and uh, so that'll be happening at the summit, but then there's going to be a whole ride series kind of leading up to the summit that uh, different people will be hosting kind of all over the U.S. And that's just an opportunity for people to like get together, ask questions about the summit, brainstorm ideas of what people want to see. So our kind of whole idea behind it was, it came out of, you know, conversations on bike tours that, you know, Sarah and Nam and I were talking about it on the Baja, like this time last year. <laughs> it's cool. it's like, you know, I've learned so much from you in the last like, couple of days. Like we were all just like talking about like, you know, Sarah's just like this font of wisdom of like all of this experience and Nam as well. And there are a lot of us out there. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's been really amazing kind of like even – putting this out there into the world because uh, when you feel seen, <laughs> um, it's a really great experience, like a, like a rally kind of cry where we've like met so many and discovered so many amazing writers um, who don't identify as like the like traditional, like go out, conquer that mountain <laughs> person. <laughs> um, so that was, that was really exciting and we're looking forward to the rides. I think that it'll be a really fun opportunity. Cool. So what's the, um, just like a brass tacks question, what, uh, how many people, what's the capacity at Whitefish that, how many people do you hope to, to get out there? Yeah. So we, uh, we rented out the whole bike retreat. Awesome. <laughs> so we have the lodge, all the campsites <coughs> and the whole space will be kind of open up to, um, of course, Cricket never turns anyone away. So like, it's not, uh, going to be a, a situation where if you're out there and you're hoping to be there. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be around 150 people capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also including organizers and also like uh, caterers and catering help uh, staff. So yeah, it's a lot of people. <laughs> but like, you know, I think that it'll be a really great opportunity to kind of like have a lot of different voices in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also really important. So, who yeah. who should attend? Is this first like the complete noob, someone that has some experience, lots of experience? Like who who do you, in, in your when you uh, imagine a, an attendee, who who would you want to see there? Um, so this is actually like the reason why we kind of made it focused around people who use their bikes to explore, as opposed to like bike packers, like just bike packers. Um, is because I think that we all have a lot of different skill sets to share with one another that really kind of helps support regardless of like what kind of adventure travel you do on your bike. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you are really adamant on going on like really intense, like super long day rides and, you know, but you need to pack some like basics to people who do like, you know, they want to ride like the Baja Divide or the Great Divide or like the TAT or something. Um, but also people who are interested in like getting into it and want to be in an environment that feels very open and welcoming to questions mm -hmm. and also just like a lot of different perspectives. Um, so I think that if you're really new to it, it's a great spot for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm also going to be teaching an intro to dirt touring workshop for adventure cycling the weekend before. 
So if you're like super, super new, um, you can come to that and then like stay for the party. <laughs> <laughs> nice. so, um, and that's also going to be held at the Whitefish Bike Retreat, um, just like the weekend before. And so there's kind of, there's something for everybody, I think, whatever level you're at. Um, and I think that even if you're really new and you kind of jump into it, I think that people are often surprised by what they're capable of. Right. Like when they really put themselves into it, it's really <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what's a uh, best case scenario what do you want someone to, to walk away with from the experience i mean I, I know you guys are still in the planning stages but like yeah. okay <laughs> i mean i think that if people walk away feeling like confident and like their skill set to be able to pack and plan for a trip um, but also walk away with a lot of connections of people that they want to ride with mm -hmm. i think that that's a huge thing is like being able to figure out like you know how to pack and plan for a trip, but also like how to feel comfortable reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people contact me every once in a while and are like, how do you like know so many people in the bike community? And I was like, I like, I'm shamelessly always just like, hey, you seem like a really neat person. I want to meet you. And people are like 99.9% .9 like, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's actually how you and I met. Yeah. I was just randomly in Portland and I sent a message to you and Laura and I was like hey I really respect and admire what you do like do you want to have coffee about it and uh, I think that largely people are afraid to use social media for what it's for <laughs> like <laughs> use what it's used for uh, <laughs> like social media is a platform and a tool for you to actually engage with people in the real world mm -hmm. um, or it can be like you do you but like I think that it is a really great tool. Um, so if people walk away from the summit feeling confident about their skills, um, but also excited to like plan routes or be more involved in their communities or lead rides, um, and just feel kind of connected with a, a group larger than just their space at home. <laughs> yeah, cool. <clears throat> well, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know visibility uh, for women in the bike industry. Um, do you have any theories that why they they're so terrible at it <laughs> um i i have some theories and I, largely <laughs> um so and i think that it's kind of an analog for a lot of uh themes of like you know production around like how do we get these people to like this thing and it's like no it's not um it's not that kind of conversation like it needs to actually be a conversation so in order to actually like represent you know women trans from like gender non-binary people, you need to have people not just like represented like in photos, but like actually generating that content. Right. Like I think that for me, like as someone who works with communities um, to develop a lot of exhibitions and like this is kind of a different like field, but I think that it's very similar is like you don't develop like an issue driven exhibition or like a uh, community driven idea without involving that community. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. So um, I think that there's like, you know, it's beyond product testing, it's beyond marketing. It's actually like involving those voices and inviting those people to actually like be at the table, mm -hmm. like, talk, <laughs> like right. using their voices um, instead of just like, I'm going to like put the camera on you now and like I'm helping. Right, right. <laughs> no, like, find the people who are really active in that community and like invite them to actually like create that content and they're going to connect better with those audiences than you ever will. Um, and that's just being smart about it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It seems so basic, but also is like completely not what the bike industry does. Generally yeah. it's very like, you know, top down, Marketing. you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to make you buy this product, you know, regardless of whether you actually want it or not, but we'll, we'll say it's cool. Yeah. Um, and like you said, like it's, you know, I, I, yeah, they just have a hard time like including, uh, you know, other people in the conversation. Right. Well, it becomes very insular. And I think people are like, I get rad. I want to just like reproduce what I want to see in the world. And like, it's not just you, it's not just for you. Right. <laughs> there are a lot of us out there, I think. And, uh, I think there is a lot of like siloing within the bike industry and with a lot of industry. Um, and I think people have a lot of like fear of giving up their place at the table because like, Oh, what would happen if I like, <laughs> but I'll like, do my job and I do it better. 
like, oh my God. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it's, just, yeah, it is really surprising uh, because it's such an effective way to actually like be present and actually represent a community. It's just like, oh no, like, why don't you just take, take the mic? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So what do you, how do you see, uh, I guess, social media working in, the, in that equation? I think that social media, again, is like a really great tool because, you know, everybody is their own kind of content producer. Like, and in a really weird way, like people have a brand, like Benedict has a brand. <laughs> it's also like him as a person. But uh, it really like allows you to, to hold your own mic. Um, but I think that the thing is, is there's also this element of like amplification. Like how do those voices get heard? How do you like amplify these people who are like saying really great things? Mm -hmm. um, and social media is largely like kind of self-selecting as right. well. So, <laughs> It's a great way for people to, to feel heard and be heard. Um, but I think that also like some things just catch like wildfire and some things don't. Right. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It is. Yeah. That, that's the word. That's the word for it. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. No, it's just like, it's so complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you, uh, this, do you think, uh, uh, Instagram or social media has uh, improved or, or hurt the bike travel experience? Oh, again, uh, remember that one time when we were like, wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it still is. Uh, yeah. So I think that it's been a really great like way for people to kind of like share these experiences and to like, get really excited and motivated to get out there. Um, I think we are like generating so much content though that it's kind of like normalized really extreme travel. Right. <laughs> so I kind of feel like, mm -hmm. oh, in order to actually like, you know, go on an adventure, I have to like, you know, be out in the desert for days and <laughs> you know, carry four days worth of food and water. It's like, no, you, you can just like go for a ride, it's cool. Yeah. Um, but I think that like, yeah, in that way it's it's kind of I think complicated this interaction between people and like if you aren't the type of person that's like willing to reach out and talk to people about those experiences you can get the idea that it is way more extreme than it is mm -hmm. um and it doesn't have to be <laughs> it can't be. It's super fun i love i love that shit but <clears throat> i also like you know extending my commute home and getting lost and like you know coming back at like midnight realizing that there's a road out there that I never knew was there, you know, like that's an adventure too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, having that kind of respect for that time is also really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like in some ways, um, you know, there's kind of like a ep epicer than thou uh, attitude sometimes, <laughs> you know, and it's <laughs> like, and I'm not going to post about my, you know, overnight, you know, trip where I go ride and fish a small creek because it's not like epic enough to be on, on Instagram. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, it, in some ways it's, it's a little sad that people feel like, you know, like it, it's not a valid bike trip unless you you're carrying your bike through, you know, ten miles of, of mud at, at right. one point or something. <laughs> yeah, that's its own adventure, but also at the same time, like just like, you know, it's scalable. And I think that that's an important thing to recognize. But also, like, I started an Instagram account because um, I was going overseas for, like, an indefinite bike trip. And I had no phone, <laughs> no computer. And I didn't want to send, like, a million emails to people, like, letting them know I'm still alive. And so, like, you know, we post a photo every, like, week or two or something. And it's just like, still alive. Hi. <laughs> and, um and that was kind of like, I think it's still used for that for a lot of people too. Like it's a way to kind of check in on people and like see how you're doing without like, you know, having to be in constant contact. Um, and then people can kind of, I think that the tools have developed in a way where people can actually like choose to be a larger part of that conversation if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, or not. And uh, yeah, I think in that way it's, Again, it's it's a tool, and like if you use a tool for what it's used for, <laughs> it's gonna give you the result you need. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if you, you know, if you use a hammer when a screwdriver will do, you know, it's gonna be a bad situation. Yeah. <laughs> use your toolkit. <laughs> yes. 
So you're also, um, are you're on the board of bikepacking routes as well, or? No, I'm, uh, I'm actually just, um, uh, like regional ambassador. Mm -hmm. And so I started as a regional ambassador, um, for the Northern Rockies region when I was living in Missoula. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when I got this job in Santa Cruz, I moved out here and there's also like, um, Spencer Harding is out here as well. And Eric Maffey, who are also, um, bikepacking routes ambassadors, like for mm -hmm. the more Northern region. So we just recently had a roundup which cool. was super, super fun. Uh, two weeks ago in Oakland at Lucky Duck Cycles. Mm -hmm. And we just like gave a talk about bike packing routes. Right. And like a lot of people showed up. Wow, cool. What was <laughs> it? Um, and people were actually really interested in like, how can bike packing be used again as a tool uh, for public lands advocacy? Um, and so that was a really fun conversation. And then we all went camping afterwards. And that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what is it about uh, bikepacking routes that, that you like personally? Personally, I, I love the focus on like the way that we interact with the land. I think that like the fact that it's kind of like, it's a, you know, it's all around bikepacking, which is this like, you know, like cool, sexy thing people want to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's using that kind of like almost as a front for like, <laughs> for like public spaces. <laughs> <laughs> Because every single route actually has this really like in-depth kind of um, like user section where it actually tells you all about the different types of public land you're going through, which lands are at risk, and who to contact. <laughs> <laughs> and like the idea is like if people have like a unique relationship with the land, they'll feel ownership over it and they'll want to protect it. Um, and like kind of spreading that, you know, like sense of like this is our space. Um, and there's actually like, you know, I think that there are a lot of voices still missing within bikepacking routes, um, cause it's like public lands, but it's also like stolen land. Right. Um, <laughs> that's a really big conversation too. And I think a conversation that's not really happening right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's like, how do we think about the landscapes that we're, that we're in and the landscapes that we ride on and these places that we really value, like what's their history? How are they used? Who's managing them? What are they doing to them? <laughs> right. Um, and thinking about road systems too, like this is a really interesting kind of aspect of like, why are there roads or trails in a certain area? And it's usually because of like natural resource extraction. <laughs> and so like thinking about a landscape mm -hmm. in terms of like, oh, this is like where they like mine uranium or like this is where they like do timber, like, cutting right um, and like why certain roads exist i think you run into this a lot in montana where mm -hmm. there's like all these roads that exist to a point and like once they've reached this like point of usefulness they just end right <laughs> if you just try to build like a forest service road like you could just get so lost and the road just ends right um, and so yeah i think that bikepacking routes is a really a like, great opportunity for us to think more in depth about how we use these spaces Cool. So it's kind of like um, like advocacy uh, rolled around or adventure rolled around advocacy, kind of like. Yes. A... <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah, it's like a adventure parfait, and um, it's. Uh, I think it's a really great strategy because you're taking something that is like people are interested in, and people are like is gaining a lot of momentum, and you're using it like using your power for good <laughs> like, and i think that's really great and it's like it's free to become a member mm -hmm. all of the maps and the routes are free um and i think that that's like that's kind of an amazing strategy as well right i know it's still pretty new so we'll see like how that goes but i think that like just getting as many people on board creating as much visibility around these things as possible is like a really great place to start <laughs> yeah yeah, I think that's one of the the challenges with um, you know, like kind of the explosive growth of uh, biking, bike packing, maybe that a lot of people are super stoked on it, but you know they may you know just miss the basics, like you know who owns the land, uh, stuff like leave no trace. You know, you you know you, you get super excited about you know getting out there, but then you know you you kind of don't have this awareness of of what you're traveling through and its implications if you leave a mess and everything <laughs> well i think a lot of people like 
I think self-awareness is like critically lacking for most people in our work. <laughs> <laughs> so like whether or not you notice it when you're like walking down the street and like people just like have no sense of like their own space. Like, you know, if you didn't grow up like backpacking or you didn't grow up like with those experiences, like you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that like having more opportunities for people to like enter into it, it without feeling like shame or embarrassment around like just not automatically knowing these things, it's really important. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for like people who like grew up in areas or within families or within contexts that they just like weren't exposed to that as kids, you know, mm -hmm. like that's okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's fine. That's actually like most of the world. And so um, having those tools readily available um, and free, um, I think is really important. Yeah, I remember um, attending uh, a Leave No Trace um, kind of, I guess, presentation in Portland around bikepacking. And you know, the question came up of, you know, who should educate the, uh, <clears throat> the consumer? You know, is it the bike brand? Is it the bike shop? Like as someone buys their bike packing bike with all their camping gear, they should have like little, you know, this is how to you know, be a good steward or like at, at what point does that education come into, you know, the, the learning and the experience? So, okay. Leave no trace. <laughs> As an online like course that you can take and get like your certification or certificate or whatever. It takes five minutes. <laughs> it's great. You learn a lot. Um, but they also sell these like really great plastic cards. And personally, <laughs> like a, I'm just spitballing here, but it'd be really cool if, uh, you know, bike shops that actually sold like uh, all terrain bikes or bike packing rigs, like what if every bike packing bag, you know, if you're a first time like buyer of this kind of equipment, like came with that little LNT card, which mm -hmm. is basically yeah. the basics of Leave No Trace in a really like easy, digestible, like permanent kind of card. And then they can just pass it around when they don't need it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way. Um, but when you asked earlier, like who's responsible? And I think, yes, like if you're, you know, things come with instructions, <laughs> I don't ever read them, but like, uh, I think that if people are going to be encouraging, like people to go out and do these things, they also need to be like, and it doesn't have to be educating. Like you don't know this. I'm going to teach you like right. <laughs> just saying like, Hey, there are these things that are available. If you want to know they're over here. Um, like letting people know they're there, I think is a big piece because a lot of people don't know they're there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, totally, I, I totally agree. I feel like there should be something at the, the point of sale that just kind of, you know, says, you know, there's this thing. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Oh, you're part of this community. And as part of that, you know, like, hear all of these other kind of like principles and ideas but i also think that's why like writing with other people and like finding community is so important too because like that's a really great way to learn some of those things like firsthand and so you know that's another great way for people to to kind of learn <laughs> <laughs> yeah when, when we first set off on our, our bike tour i was not a camper i mean i grew up in la so yeah. a lot of my learning was on youtube you know, and like, you know, how to start a campfire, how to tie knots. Uh, you know, someone recommended this book, How to Shit in the Woods. And it's like, you know, if, if you didn't grow up with like a, a family that sent you out to Boy, uh, uh, Boy Scouts or, or whatever outdoor program, then you, ju you just wouldn't know. Totally. I, and like, and the internet, ugh, the internet is my wife. Like, honestly, it like tells me everything that I need to know. Um, I think that like YouTube is a great resource for those things. Um, you know, it's a great way to learn. Yeah. <laughs> As someone who like grew up going to Girl Scout camp, like there are definitely things that I have learned more effectively just Googling it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> than I did when I was a kid. So, right. Well, that's yeah. one, th one thing I really appreciate about the, um, what, what sounds like the satellite events that you guys are organizing around um, the WTF Explorers. It's like there is that opportunity to, to, to learn um, you know, with, yeah. other, with other people. Totally. And like the idea is like, we're not there to teach people anything. <laughs> we're here to like facilitate, you know, it's like, you know, we learn best from each other. And um, I think that like organizing opportunities for people to actually like get together and like skill share, like everybody's got something to bring to the table. And so like getting everybody together to go on a camping trip, like you're going to learn so much <laughs> like just on that trip. 
like you are an amalgam of every human you meet. And so like the more opportunities you have to actually like be in those contexts, like the more equipped you will be to feel confident doing these things. Right. Um, so you uh, worked a stint at Adventure Cycling. Um, you're an ambassador for, for bike packing routes. Do you have any sense of where this whole bike travel, bike touring, bike packing thing is going to head, head off to in the future? The moon. The moon. Uh, <laughs> I, I really don't know. It's really hard to say. Um, I think that as more people are feeling comfortable like going off road, like they're realizing a lot of the advantages of that. So like, you know, no traffic. It's beautiful <laughs> like, you know but there are certain things that you do need to know and so i think like as that part of the industry continues to grow i think that like clinics classes like all these things are going to continue to develop um a little bit um you know i think that a lot of uh bike travel like touring companies or organizations that are focused around like people like pay to play opportunities. Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I think that people really want to feel like a sense of like ownership to their, their experiences. And I think that like, you know, maybe there is more opportunity for like people contracting with people to develop a route, you know, like we were talking about earlier around, you know, these interests or these areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will continue to grow, I think a little bit. Um, but yeah, I'm no futurist. <laughs> <laughs> I think there will be, I think people will continue to be riding more on like multi-surface, you know, excursions mm -hmm. and not so much just road riding mm -hmm. or road touring. But I think that'll always be there too. Because that is like it is the baseline most accessible thing. Mm -hmm. So, like yeah. you can take your touring bike, modify it slightly, and like start bike packing pretty much at any point. It's like any bike is a bike packing bike if you believe in yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think the whole spectrum will always be there. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I definitely think like. Um... Um, like you were saying with like the, the, the teaching opportunities, I think that's like a big gap. Like it's really easy for, you know, as a consumer or something that's new that's, that has the stoke to, to purchase the gear, but you can't necessarily purchase knowledge. So you need those opportunities to, to kind of learn and, uh, you know, do it with other people. Um, and from what we've seen on like the, on like the bicycle tourism slash events side, there's definitely um, some, some road events that are starting to dabble in gravel. Some kind yeah. of, you know, like we did the ramble ride, which was like an interesting format where it was like right. bike packing, but with beer, with a beer garden at the end of each day. Right. Which sounds awesome. Supported <laughs> bike packing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is a great, like, if you're just getting into it, like, you know, it's also not for everybody. And like, that's okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so like, if you try and experience like the ramble ride where you, you know, have this supported experience, you're really like riding on gravel. That's great. That like might be your thing. Right. <laughs> and I don't want to go any further. <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool well i think uh i'll wrap up on this note i think we're at like 43 minutes already <laughs> um so thank you whitney for joining us and if you guys enjoyed this episode of, of plp talks be sure to like share subscribe if you have suggestions for future guests leave those in the comments below and thank you uh again whitney for for talking with us today you bet thanks for inviting me <laughs> yeah cool right. talk to you soon